Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the From the Booth podcast. My name is Mike. Um, coming back at you with another full-length podcast episode. I've been a little inconsistent with the pod episodes, but during the off-season, I'm going to be giving you guys at least one full-length episode a week, um, kind of talking over the events of the week, what happened, where we're going, everything like that. As you guys know, we are kind of in the dead period of the NFL, so I might be grasping at straws a little bit for some headlines, but I do think we have a really good episode planned for you guys today, and I'm very excited to get back in the swing of things and present it to you guys in this kind of podcast format style. And, you know, like I said, I think we have a really good show in store for you guys. We're going to cover the new kickoff rule in the NFL. Um, we're going to talk about the remake of the NCAA football game. Uh, we're going to talk about OTAs and their kicking off in the league and kind of what that means for a lot of players and teams. We're going to talk about Jordan Love and what my expectations are for him going into the season as the Packers now full-time starting quarterback. We're also going to talk about the 49ers quarterback room. And then at the end of the video, I'm going to have to ask you guys of your opinion of a few video ideas that I plan to make. Um, I want to get, I want to kind of gauge what kind of interest I have. Um, but before we get started into this video, into this podcast episode, I do want to say to make sure to subscribe and follow on whatever platform that you're listening on. Um, if you're on YouTube, please make sure to subscribe. If you're on Anchor or Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever, uh, make sure to follow the channel and rate five stars. That would be really helpful for the uh, podcast. Very much would appreciate it. Um, but let's go ahead and get into the first segment of this podcast episode. So the NFL recently has um, initiated a new rule um, during the kickoffs in which um, a player can now call a fair catch at any point um, and the ball will be placed at the 25-yard line. Now, a lot of players and a lot of coaches have been really um, not liking this rule. Um, just, you know, in the past day or two, I've seen Travis Kelsey talk about it and say that it's bad for the game. Um, I've talked about, uh, I've heard Dan Campbell talking about it, you know, so several coaches and several players are kind of voicing their opinions about the fact that they don't really approve of this rule. Um, but I'm, I just want to give my opinions and maybe some of the, the pros and the cons of this new rule. So to start off, the league has been very at least outwardly focused on the prevention of concussions for several years now. Um, you know, we've seen that in a multitude of different ways. We've seen certain things become illegal, certain helmets being required, uh, everything like that, right? And a few years ago, I believe it was 2017, but don't quote me, um, the touchback line was moved from the 20-yard line to the 25-yard line to encourage less kickoff returns. And the reason because of that is because kickoffs – uh, the data proved that kickoffs were the most dangerous play in football. And that makes sense to me. Um, you know, you have 11 players charging full speed at a guy returning. You know, they have a lot of time to build up speed, to build up momentum. There's probably going to be a lot of injuries. Uh, additionally, the NFL made the rule that um, the kickoff team was not allowed to go forward until the ball had been kicked. That was also a rule that's been implemented recently in the NFL. But now, you know, they're double and tripling down on this kickoff safety initiative that they've started by now allowing fair catches anywhere on the field to be automatically brought to the 25-yard line. Now, I, I don't like this rule for a couple of reasons. A, I think although kickoffs might be the most dangerous play, I don't think basically erasing them is a good way to solve the problem, right? Because... Now, the likelihood of returns diminishes even more, and in my opinion, at least, there's nothing more exciting in an NFL game than, like, a 100-yard kickoff return touchdown. A, fans love it. B, it's a complete game-changer, um, and I just think it's a really cool play. But this is going to decrease kickoffs, therefore decreasing, you know, kickoff returns and everything like that. Okay. Um, I think another thing, and I think this devalues special teams a little bit, you know, uh, I think some kickers... Um, can be really good at at putting the ball in a certain spot where you know it has to be returned or it has to you know they can kind of pin the receiver deep and now it really doesn't matter how well your kicker does uh, because if their turner wants to automatically take it to the 25 yard line they can just wave their hand up and as long as they successfully catch the ball you know it, it is what it is um, I, I I just think that uh, it's it's just it's just a rule it takes a lot of the excitement away from the game it takes a lot of the value away from the special teams. And it makes it so the game, it's safer, but I think there were better alternatives to go about providing safety on the kickoff. Um, I don't think that this was it necessarily. And, you know, t players and teammates, uh, they're not really liking it either. So I'm guessing it's just going to be a rule that's 
instituted this year. I don't think it will make it past this year too much. And um, I'm not really in love with it, to be honest with you. Um, another thing I think it does is I think it makes it so um, field position will matter a little bit less. Um, again, punting obviously will be a big thing, but if you can you know, guarantee me that you're going to get the ball to the 25-yard line, and touchbacks I know have been increased in popularity, and I, I get that. Um, and you've always been able to, you know, fair catch it in the end zone and to get out to the to the 20 or the 25-yard line. But there's just something about it that I just I don't appreciate. And I think that it takes a little bit of the excitement away from the game. I think that it takes away some strategic elements of having a kicker or having a um, the way you align your kickoff team. I don't know. I don't, I'm not a fan of it. Um, but obviously, I want to hear your guys' opinions. So, you know, let me know what you think of the new kickoff rule. Let me know what you think it does um, for the game. And let me know if you think it's going to stay past this year. I'm very interested to hear your opinions. All right, now let's talk about NCAA football. Um, it's coming back. And if you guys were anything like me as a kid, you played NCAA religiously until it got canceled after NCAA 14. That was the last one. I played that game so much. I played that game all the time. And I was in love with the NCAA uh, franchise as a kid. I thought it was, like, the coolest thing to play as college players. Um, I thought you know, all the read option and triple option plays were so cool. But like many people, my favorite game mode was Dynasty. You know, being able to take control of a team, whether as a coach, an offensive coordinator, or whatever, and to completely turn a program around and rebuild, you know, Abilene Christian. I'm just going to make up a team. You know, that, like, that was such a fun appeal of college. But one thing that always kind of stuck out like a sore thumb to me was unless you kind of downloaded some uh, roster that somebody else made, you didn't have the players' names in NCAA football. You didn't have um, the ability to play as Derrick Henry or Johnny Manziel. Or, you know, you, you guys, you had guys from the past, maybe like old Heisman winners and stuff, but you weren't able to play as the current crop of college football players. Well, it looks like that problem is now solved in NCAA football. Thank God. Um, as you guys may or may not know, NCAA football has come back. And it's going to be released in the summer of 2024. I thought it was going to be released this year, but I'll, I can wait a year. Um, it's going to be released in the summer of 2024. And there's a report out now that it will include the name, image, and likeness of college football players present in college football in 2024. And that's big. That is huge news. I absolutely love that. The fact that you'll be able to play as real-life college football players. I think that's great. I think this is um, a benefactor of the NIL Popular, popularization in the college football landscape. I think the fact that uh, players are now being able to make money off of their likeness and the fact that they're able to, you know, brand themselves more, I think is great for the game of college football, but it's also clearly the key factor in including these players' real image and likeness in the football game. Um, now, the exact how, you know, whereabouts of what's going to happen with the finances is still a little, you know, murky. Um, my guess would be that each player is going to get a check of some kind to allow their likeness to be in the game. Uh, maybe some of the more big time players might ask for a little bit more, or maybe it's going to be a check just written to the team. I don't know exactly how it's going to go, but I do know with that now the power of NIL and the you know monetiz monetization of the collegiate athlete being uh, you know socially acceptable in the college football world, it's going to happen. And this is very exciting for me. I'm very excited to be able to play as the real college football players, be able to play um, as all of these guys, you know, incoming recruits, everything like that. And, you know, imagine, um, if how, imagine how it is for these athletes, man. I mean, you know, you're probably, a, when you're coming out of high school and, you know, maybe you're a walk-on at a big school or maybe you're playing at, you know, just some lowly FBS school. But to see your name in the video game, I think would be really, really cool. And I think that it's going to be cool for a lot of kids, a lot of high. Now you know, not every not every college athlete's Caleb Williams, right? Some of these guys are not going to make the league. Some of these guys are not going to play beyond you know the next one or two years at their university. The fact that they can be in a video game is really cool for them. Additionally, they might get paid a little bit to be that, so that's awesome. Um, I'm always in favor of the student athletes, and I think that any way we can enhance their collegiate experience is awesome. Very excited to play as the as the actual students, and I think that. Um, you know, we're going to have some fun. We're going to have some fun with the new NCAA. I also heard a rumor that they are going to be prioritizing dynasty mode, which is one of the biggest mistakes that Madden makes. They do not give a shit about franchise. They put all their time, money, and resources into ultimate team. NCAA doesn't sound like that. It sounds like they're actually going to put a lot more 
um, into Dynasty than Madden does, which is great because, like I said, myself and many others' favorite game mode was always Dynasty. I think in college football, Dynasty just holds a little bit more because, um, you know, it's, it's just a little different than the NFL. You know, NFL, you have the draft. But in, in college, you know, you can scout guys, you can recruit guys. You know, it's, it's a whole thing. And I just love the dynamic that Dynasty brought to NCAA 14 specifically. Um, and it looks like it's coming back bigger, better, and stronger. So I'm very excited for NCAA 14. I'm um, sorry, NCAA 2024, excuse me. And um, I hope that you guys are as well. So let me know in the comments what you guys think of NCAA football and how excited you are to finally be able to play as your favorite college athletes. All right, the next topic of discussion on the docket today is OTAs. Now, OTAs, um, we're in the period of time where OTAs are voluntary, right? Um, and if any of you guys have played high school sports, you know that the word voluntary doesn't really mean voluntary. Voluntary means you're showing up, and if you're not, you better have a damn good reason. Um, that's how it was for high school sports. You know, whenever they told you, there's no such thing as an optional high school practice. You know, when your coach says it's optional, it means you better, your ass better be there and be there on time. Um, and while obviously it's not the same way in the NFL, um, I do think OTAs matter a decent bit. And I think that if a player isn't at OTAs, um, with the exception of some sort of injury or surgery or off-season procedure, if a player isn't at OTAs, it's typically a bit of a red flag. Not always. Sometimes players train elsewhere or do whatever. Um, but more often than not, you would really prefer your best players to be at OTAs. Um, so we're at that time in the year where some players, you know, aren't at OTAs. They're skipping for numerous reasons. Again, they're having off-season, whatever. They're injured. They're training elsewhere. Um, and for some players, it's more concerning than others. Some players are, you know, like Kevin Byard, who is missing OTAs because he felt disrespected by the Titans, asking him to take a pay cut. Or Quinnen Williams, who's holding out for a new contract, hoping to become the highest paid defensive tackle in the NFL. Um, when it's for contractual reasons, I, I get it a little bit. It's, it's like a power play. It's more of a um, it's more of a bargaining chip. Like, hey, if you want me to get get here and get practicing with the team, you know, you got to pay me. Um, and I get that to a certain degree. I think it's it's definitely more um, it's it's a stronger point when it's a quarterback who's not showing up to OTAs because your team it's, it's kind of hard to function as a whole team without your starting quarterback. And, I've, you know, we've seen a couple quarterbacks. I, th I think Kyler Murray did it. I'm not totally sure. I'm pretty sure Kyler Murray did it back when he was getting his deal. But, you know, for Quinnen Williams and Kevin Byard, obviously they're doing what they can to get their money that they think they deserve. And, you know, who knows? Um, I know a couple of other players are not present at OTAs. And, again, that's that's kind of just for a, a multitude of reasons. I know Tariq Woolen for the Seahawks recently just got a procedure on his knee. And he's going to be out the next six to eight weeks. And, you know, thank God he did that during the, during the off season, not during the season. That way he doesn't have to miss valuable time during the season. I mean, that, that's half the season he would have missed. But now, you know, he'll be ready for training camp um, in July, I believe they said. So those are all set. But I think the best thing about OTAs, in my opinion at least, is to see the first action of incoming rookies. So, you know, so I've seen clips of, I've seen a lot of clips actually of Quentin Johnston with the um, Chargers. I've seen JSN and Devin Witherspoon with my Seahawks. I've seen a lot of different guys in OTAs and a lot of different rookies. So it's cool to see them uh, the first time in their new team's gear and kind of get the ball rolling, get the hype going, the fantasy experts talking about everything. So I think that that's really cool, and it's a really cool thing to see. But from what little glimpses we get to see here and there, you know, we kind of have to live off of for the next few months until the NFL season actually, actually starts with preseason and everything. Um, but OTAs are a good thing, I think. And I'm, I'm very excited to get more of a look at some of these young players, um, to follow the storylines of the guys who aren't showing up to OTAs, make sure everything's, you know, checking out and everything like that. So that is OTAs. I just want to briefly touch up on it because that is kind of the, the only thing going on in the NFL world right now, unfortunately. And, um, it's what we're going to have to live on for the next couple of months, guys. I'm sorry. I know. I know. I wish I had better news. I wish I could tell you week one was next week. I wish I could tell you the playoffs were starting next month. But we got to wait. And, you know, with football being as physical of a sport it is, the players do need a decently long offseason. So um, if we want to watch more quality, good football from our favorite teams, we just got to be patient. You know, this is kind of the dead period in the NFL. But don't worry, because while there's no football on the TV, you guys got me on YouTube to entertain you. So hopefully I can keep you uh, satisfied, pause, satisfied for that long um, until the NFL actual season starts. And then I can keep you even more satisfied. Anyway, let's head to the next topic of discussion. Okay, so Jordan Love. 
Jordan Love is now the definitive quarterback one in Green Bay. Uh, he's been sitting the bench for about three years, which is the exact way I would describe my high school football career. But now he has the opportunity to come step in and show why he was a first-round pick all of those years ago. So the question remains, um, is he a good quarterback? You know, Can he lead the Packers to the same heights that Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers led them for him? Can he continue the 30-plus years of great quarterback play for Green Bay? Please, dear God, no. And was he worth the first-round pick? These are all big question marks leading into this season with Jordan Love. And I'm here to talk about kind of what I think to expect from Jordan Love. So it's important to note that, like I said, you know, he's pretty much ridden the bench for a number of years. He had one start. Um, he didn't play too well. You know, he went 19 of 34 for 190 yards, threw a touchdown, threw one pick. Packers really only put up seven points. Those stats, while they don't look great, are probably look a little bit better than the actual result was. Um, he didn't look great. He did not look great. But in this past season, he did get to play a little bit in garbage time against the Eagles, and he looked good. You know, he threw a long touchdown pass to Christian Watson, which was mostly just the yards after catch ability of Christian Watson and his super speed running down the sideline. But I think he looked decent. He looked much better than he did the last time in Kansas City. And to his defense, really, Kansas City is a tough environment. You know, Arrowhead is one of the worst, uh, it was one of the best home field advantages in the entire NFL. You're playing up against Patrick Mahomes. That's daunting enough. You're playing up against Andy Reid. That's also crazy. And let's not forget, Steve Spagnuolo is one of the better defense coordinators in the NFL. And he really made Jordan Love's life hell in that game. Um, but... I'm not going to judge him too much off of that game. You know, like I said, tough environment. One of his first, his only start up until this point, he's appeared in six games, only started that one. So there's definitely no um, conclusive data on Jordan Love yet, to say the very least. So what do I expect from him? Um, I expect Jordan Love to be okay. I don't expect him to really light the world on fire. I don't expect him to be a pro bowler. I don't think that he's in that upper echelon of NFL uh, quarterbacks. Uh, I definitely don't think he's a top 10 guy. But I think that he's a quarterback that... I, I'm trying to articulate this without being mean, you know, because I, I, know, I know some of you Packer fans are watching, and I don't want you to immediately press that unsubscribe button. But what I'll say about Jordan Love is I didn't love him coming out of uh, Utah. I didn't love him. Um, Utah State, I believe, excuse me. And... I think that in the NFL, he he's not going to be anything special. And part of the reason is because I think the Packers' offense is getting progressively worse. Um, Aaron Jones is getting older. I think their offensive line is getting more and more beat up. Their receivers really aren't great. I know Christian Watson had a lot of good games last year in the second half of the year. But you also got to remember Aaron Rodgers was throwing him the ball. And Christian Watson, while he could be a stud, you know, if that's your wide receiver one, it's a little scary. Um well, that's not a little scary, but if Christian Watson's wide receiver one and you don't have a lot of depth behind him, like, I don't love Romeo Dubs. Um, they lost Alan Lazard in free agency. They lost Robert Tanyan. So, to me, his weapons aren't great. His offensive line is old and banged up. And his running backs, I think, are pretty good. But, you know, if, if you're just going to turn around and hand the ball off, I mean, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't really impress me about Jordan Love too much. Here's what I'll say. I think Jordan Love is going to benefit from a weak NFC, just like every NFC team is. The NFC is, like, pretty weak. So, you know, teams are going to be probably – good teams are going to be pushed up a notch because of how weak the NFC is. Um, and I think that, you know, his division isn't great. The Bears obviously aren't good. I think the Vikings will take a step down. I think the Lions are a bit overrated, and they're still the Lions. So I wouldn't be, like, shocked if they won the North. Um, and, you know, Jordan Love, he's a guy – He's got a quick release. I do say he's, he's got a very quick. I like his release a lot. And he has shown some flashes. Um, do I think he's a world beater? No. Do I think that he, uh, I mean, to be, to be honest, man, like this is basically his rookie season. You know, in the NBA, they don't count. You can be a rookie in the year, like your third year, as long as um, you haven't played yet. And he's, again, he started one game. So there is going to be that learning curve of being the starting quarterback. There is going to be that that, you know, adjustment process to when teams get enough film on him to realize his tendencies, realize his weaknesses, and he's going to have to adopt to that. He's going to have to figure it out. Um, one thing that does benefit him, though, is that he's been with the same coach for years. He should know the system by now. And he's had an entire offseason and an entire last season to build chemistry with, like, Christian Watson and Aaron Jones, A.J. Dillon, all those guys, right? 
Um, so I expect the Packers. I expect the Packers to not make the playoffs. Unfortunately, I don't think Jordan Love is going to be great. Now, the crappy thing for Jordan Love, and we'll see really how he handles pressure in this season, is that like basically, even though this is like basically his rookie year, this is also kind of like his free agency year. Um, this is his year to earn or to not earn that big contract. Um, so I know they picked up his fifth year option and everything like that, but this is a big year for Jordan Love. This is a big year for the Packers as well. Um, I don't expect Jordan Love to be too great. I expect if I had to give like a statistical prediction, my prediction would be like 3,400 yards. I'd say about 26, 27 touchdown passes and probably 13 to 14 interceptions. Um, Again, that is a pretty decent year. That's like that's pretty good numbers, but nothing crazy, nothing spectacular. Um, I don't think the Packers' offense is going to be elite by any stretch. I don't. I just don't think they have the offensive structure in play. Ever since Devontae Adams left, they've felt like they just don't have enough there at the receiver position. I don't think, and I think that was part of the reason Aaron Rodgers wanted to leave and go to New York because um, he knew Alan Lazard wasn't going to stay in Green Bay, and he probably wanted to get the fuck out of there. So he went to New York, recruited Alan Lazard there, and yeah, that's what I think about Jordan Love. So um, that's my thoughts on Jordan Love. Uh, but before we get into the next segment of the podcast episode, I do want to hear a word from our first ever sponsor. Do any of you guys like horror movies out there? I mean, my audience is mostly 18 to 20-something-year-old males, so a lot of you guys have to love horror movies. But for those of you who love horror movies, do I have the perfect upcoming film studio for you? My friends over at Dead Silence Films are working on a brand new interactive horror experience and are making a fan film of the Halloween film franchise. The fan film they're working on is called Happy Halloween, and it follows the direct events of the first Halloween movie and gives you a little bit more context leading into the second Halloween movie. And trust me, you guys, this is pretty good. You will not want to miss out on this. There are many very, very talented people working on this project, and I'm very excited for when it finally comes out. And you guys will be very excited as well. So make sure to follow Dead Silence Films on all social media platforms. Stay up to date with the movie. And then make sure to watch the movie when it comes out. Once again, big thank you to Dead Silence Films for sponsoring this podcast episode. Let's go ahead and check out the next segment. All right. And speaking of quarterbacks, let's talk about the San Francisco 49ers and their quarterback situation that they got going on. Um, the little love triangle that Kyle Shanahan has between Sam Darnold, Trey Lance, and Brock Purdy. Now, as I've discussed before, you know, the 49ers have been very held back by their um, quarterback situation. Kind of like me being held back from going Division I in my sport by my God-given athletic ability. Now, the 49ers are a team that, you know, really have it all. Great defense, great offensive line good weapons, good coach, good general manager, um, shitty stadium. But, you know, the 49ers, they really need some production. They need somebody to step up from the quarterback position. And, you know, hearing Kyle Shanahan talk, you know, in the early part of OTAs, um, at least in my opinion, he doesn't have no fucking clue what's going on at quarterback. He has said things like, we have three guy, we have three franchise guys. Um, I also heard a quote that said, Two of these guys were top five picks, and Brock Purdy played like it last year. Stuff like that. Um, Kyle Shanahan, to me, is talking like most men who are overcompensating for something. And I'm not going to say what that something is. You guys know what I mean. I think that Kyle Shanahan is trying to lie to himself and trying to lie to the 49ers fan base about the confidence level that he really has in these quarterbacks. Here's the reality of it. You know, we talked about the fact that two of these guys are top five picks. Okay, the fact that you have two guys that are top five picks means that they weren't built out to be what they were as top five picks. Um, and to say that Brock Purdy played like a top five pick last year, I think is just wrong. I don't think Brock Purdy, again, I wasn't blown away by what Brock Purdy did last year. The most I was blown away by him was his um, preparedness and his professionalism. You know, the fact that he was able to come in and win those games for the 49ers um, it was good. But I wouldn't say that Brock Purdy was the one winning those games. I would say Brock Purdy was just not losing a lot of those games. Um, that's, not even, that's not even forgetting about the fact that Brock Purdy got injured in the NFC Championship game. And I don't want to harp on his injury. You know, Kyle Shanahan said, only God knows when Brock Purdy's going to come back. 
Again, not exactly words of encouragement. But let's talk about um, Trey Lance and Sam Donald. Because I think if Brock Purdy's back and he's healthy, he's going to be the starter. I think he definitely did earn that. Um, but let's talk about Trey Lance and Sam Donald. Sam Donald, ever since he's come to the NFL, has just been a turnover machine. Uh, interceptions, fumbles, a- everything like that. Overthrow, he's seeing ghosts, you know, like, not great. I think Sam Donald does not fit into the Kyle Shanahan, Shanahan scheme at all. I think that Kyle Shanahan wants game managers who can occasionally make plays out of structure. Um, I think if Sam Darnold comes in and is just a turnover machine, that it will completely derail what the 49ers are trying to do on offense. It'll completely derail it. You know, um, Jimmy, even in the height of the Niners days when they went to the Super Bowl, and even, you know, not last year, but the year before when they went to the NFC Championship game, at his best, Jimmy was a good game manager who didn't lose the 49ers games. You know, he wasn't doing anything spectacular, but... You know, at his best, again, he was not turning the ball over a ridiculous amount. He wasn't throwing back-breaking interceptions or anything like that. So thinking about that and thinking about Sam Darnold, the guy who has proven throughout his whole career that he just can't resist uh, putting the ball in harm's way, um, it's whatever. So that's Sam Darnold. I have not a lot of faith in Sam Darnold. Um, I, think if, I think if it doesn't work out in San Francisco for him, like if Kyle Shanahan can't fix him, he might be donezo because if Kyle Shanahan can't fix you as a quarterback, you're probably not going to make it in the NFL. Now let's go on to Trey Lance. Trey Lance, kind of similar to what I was just saying about Jordan Love, the results so far have been inconclusive. There's been some good, some bad, but there's not enough to tell one way or the other. Trey Lance this offseason went to a uh, specialist to uh, fix his throwing motion. It had been a bit more elongated in years past, um, kind of like something like this, like where he put the ball down a lot. And then you would kind of throw like this. And obviously you want a short stroke, a short, you know, arm path, efficient arm path, like they say. And from what I've seen in OTAs, um, it does look like his throwing motion is a bit better. But then again, they were saying a lot of the same thing last year. So I don't really know exactly what to believe. But Trey Lance looks to be uh, the most talented of the three quarterbacks in the 49ers. He does have great athletic ability, although with that broken ankle, you know, I would be a little careful. Um, he does have, you know, a decent arm. He does have capabilities. But from what I've been hearing and from what I've been, you know, seeing in reports, they're not blown away by his intelligence. You know, maybe he struggled to grasp the offense. Maybe he's, you know, not impressed the coaches in a lot of ways that you might like. And I think that's concerning. I really do. You know, he's been a guy who um, he's been in this league for a couple of seasons, riding the bench or, you know, on IR. He kind of should have the offense down at this point. He kind of should be, you know, moving through it. He's at the same coach um, who's running the offense. So the fact that the offense coordinators have left really doesn't matter as much, unfortunately. Just, you know, it's Shanahan's running it all, and Shanahan's still there. Uh, he's got good weapons. George Kittle's a great weapon. Debo, Brandon Ayuk. Uh, he didn't play at all with him, but he will have him this year and Christian McCaffrey. And a good offensive line. So... Really no excuse for Trey Lance at this point. You know, he's if he really can't beat out Brock Purdy, uh, that's a pretty wasted third overall pick. And not only that, but you also traded additional first-rounders for him. So that's a pretty big bust move from the 49ers. Now, going back in time, I'm sure they would take Justin Fields third overall, but thankfully for all Bears fans out there, he fell to pick 11. We're not going to talk about that. So the 49ers this year obviously are still in contention to be one of the Super Bowl favorites. They are still a team that I think is going to be really good, definitely going to make the playoffs, probably going to be a top two or three seed in the NFC. But I wonder if their lack of consistent quality play at the quarterback position will once again be their downfall. Um, You know, last year with Brock Purdy, they looked pretty much unbeatable. That's because Brock Purdy was playing at a league average level. And before him, they have just not had league average quarterback play. You know, Jimmy was always bad. Trey's been hurt. It's just been it's just been a whole thing, right? So I think if anybody is going to give you at least solid quarterback play, it'll probably be Purdy. But if you want a guy with a higher ceiling but a much lower floor, you might want to go with Trey Lance. And if you want uh, the worst of the two, then you might just go with Sam Darnold. So it all depends. But I'm not very confident in the 49ers quarterback situations this year. And as an avid prayer on the downfall of the 49ers, nothing makes me happier. Not the fact that they're injured, but the fact that I think that they will continue to sabotage the championship hopes of the 49ers and 
yeah, that's it. So I want to hear your guys' opinions on the 49ers quarterback situation. I'm sure I'll have a lot of 40 Winer fans in my comments talking about why, you know, Brock Purdy is the next coming of Tom Brady, how, you know, he's going to win six Super Bowls and double what the 49ers have right now, and, you know, Joe Montana who, question mark. I'm sure we're going to get a lot of comments like that, and, you know, that's fine to a certain degree. Um, I'll let my I'll let my King Geno Smith do the talking next season. Um, you know, words are cheap, and, you know, he ain't right back. So that's all I'll say. But, yeah, let me know what you guys think, and let's get into the last and final and last segment of the podcast episode. All right, so my last topic of discussion for you guys is kind of like a field survey, really. Um, my plan is to make a lot of in-real-life content, actual football content, me playing on the field, showing you guys the cannon I have for an arm. Um, but I wonder if you guys have any kind of requests, any suggestions, any kind of things that you want to see um, for my in-real-life content. You know, I'm a man of the people, and I love you guys, and I really do value your opinion. I've been trying to... Uh, change the way I do things based on some of the comments I've been getting and trying to get more positive feedback for you guys. But I really do care about what you guys have to say. You know, at the end of the day, um, I love making these videos and I love doing everything, but nothing makes me happier than entertaining you guys and giving you guys some joy in your life. So um, I have a few ideas that I have for videos that I want to make, and I have a few kind of, you know, plans that I want to put into motion here pretty soon. But I wanted to get your opinion first because at the end of, at the, end of the day, your opinion matters more than anybody else's. And I just want to hear what you guys have to say. I want to, you know, listen to your voice a little bit. So if you have any video ideas, if you have any jokes, if you have any, you know, themes, anything like that that you guys want me to include in my videos, please do not hesitate to put them down below um, or to DM me on Twitter. My DMs are always open. Um, that you can find that in the uh, description of my YouTube videos. I make sure to put my, my Twitter in all of them. Um, you can always DM me. Always feel free to DM me. Um, DM me with any suggestions at all, honestly, or, or just say hi. You know, I like interacting with you guys. I've had a few guys DM me already, and it's been fun to just interact with some of my friend, fan, friends, fans, friends. I can't speak. I'm getting so excited. Um, but I love you guys, and I really do want to continue to make content that makes you guys happy. Um, some of you guys' comments actually bring a tear to my face a little bit, uh, even though I was sweating and it was, the room was hot and I have allergies and everything like that. But nonetheless, um, I appreciate you guys. And my DMs are always open. My comment section on YouTube is always open. And I'd appreciate some of your feedback. But that is going to be the episode for today, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed the podcast episode. Let me know your opinions in the comments down below. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And I will see all of you tomorrow. Peace. Hello?